Yeah, I think um, there's a cinema near me in Nottingham Broadway, like an indie one, and mm. they did. They played it for a week. They played quite a lot of everything, really. Um, but I watched on Apple Music, Apple, Apple Music, Apple Plus, um, and yeah, I think it's probably the only good film they've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Apple Plus's tagline should be. Apple Plus, a streaming service that definitely exists. Yeah, it's uh, honestly. I mean, we got it. I get it free because I'm a student. So, ah, but like, um, the actual TV shows are apparently quite good, but all the mm. films just look absolutely terrible. Other than this one, I mean, they've got yes. a new one going out with Mark, no, Ryan Reynolds and Will Ferrell, and you'd have to strap me into a chair and 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 pin me down. <laughs> You want to watch that, so it's just you know, really those that you know, not nothing worth value. Although they did win Best Picture last year with that Coda film. Really that sure was quite that. funny that because I thought if if you want a picture of the difference in like corporate strategy between Apple and Netflix, you should look at last year's Oscars where Apple got three Oscar nominations and won every single one, and Netflix got like thirteen nominations and won one. What was their win? Was it Power of the Duck? Best director for Jane Campion, yeah. 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 And then uh, best screenplay, was it? Adapted screenplay and, and best picture. That, yeah, it, Power of the Dog came up in most categories and went yeah. away empty-handed in almost all of them. Well, yeah. best. I guess best director is probably the most important. Best so. director is a feather in the cap. I think, you know, I, I can feel charitable towards Netflix for finally finally, finally getting Jane Campion that fucking best director Oscar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you just, and you just wrote about that, right? The Power of I Dog. did, yeah, yeah. I just wrote about that for the Geek Show. And, you know, it, it's funny when you've got a film that was, like, right in the centre of the Oscar conversation, you watch it again a year later and you feel like you're reappraising some, like, centuries-old <laughs> forgotten classic. And, yeah, yeah. It, it stands up well. Twelve months have not yeah. withered it. I actually I actually still haven't seen it. Or Coda. I, I didn't watch either of them, actually. I think... Um, I I Coda. Coda. Yeah, I was going to see it at the cinema again, but I just... Um, it's, you know, it's kind of just that period of time where it's just... Like, so much stuff comes out and you're just like, God, which one am I going to watch? And No, absolutely, Yeah. yeah. Uh, enjoyable though this preamble is, uh, and I'm I'm a big believer in preambles on podcasts. I don't get to do them often enough. Uh, we should introduce this properly. This is Pop Screen. Uh, you have not tuned into the wrong thing. Uh, I'm your host, Graham Williamson. I'm a writer for the Geek Show. We are Cult and Byline Times, and I've been joined this week for the first time on this show by uh, Oliver Parker. Uh, and, and where can people find you? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter, Oliver T. Parker. Um, I write, for, I do editing for a local magazine in Nottingham called Left Lion for the, the film section. I just recently did an interview with Tinder Sticks, which was quite fun. Oh, lovely. Yeah, about the Claire Denis collaboration. Um, How yeah. cool. Yeah, because he's from Nottingham, so it's kind of like, I ah. managed to tie it in. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, a few of the places, Film Cred, Geek Show. Um, just submitted my first piece for a website called In Review Online, which hopefully should be up soon as well. So, Good stuff. Uh, if you couldn't pick it up from what I acknowledge was a, a diffuse uh, introduction to the show, we are this week talking about Todd Haynes' uh, 2021 documentary, The Velvet Underground, which was released on Apple Plus, the extant streaming service. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, this is we, we were sort of coming at this from slightly different angles, weren't we, when we were discussing this? Yeah, I think so. To be honest, so much has happened since then. I, I can't really, <laughs> <laughs> I can't even remember to be honest. With you. I don't even There's been I... two prime ministers, I think, since we started talking yeah. about this film. <laughs> yeah, probably. I just remember getting an email from you saying, like, my copy's arrived, and I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yes, I probably watch that. Because um, this, this is quite a rare thing for us. Obviously, on the Geek Show, uh, and no doubt on several of the outlets you write for, we do review new releases of physical media quite often. But for Pop Screen, most 
Blu-ray labels are still very reluctant to put out enough 1960s beach party movies to keep us rolling on this show. Yeah. So this is really our first experiment at reviewing something that, as you listen to this, uh, will be newly out in shops. Ah, yes, because it's Criterion, isn't it? Come out. It is, yes. Yeah. And uh, I didn't, I watched it on Apple, I didn't have the criteria disc, but were there special, were there, was there special features and stuff as well? I they certainly were, yeah. I, I was, I was pleased that the special features, I haven't properly delved into them, but they seem very targeted towards me because there's like, <laughs> there's an optional sort of trivia track, I guess you could call it, where it just tells you what the experimental films being exerted are, which right. yeah, nice. is brilliant. All yeah. I could ask for, just a a great letterboxed watch filler right there. Yeah, because when I watched it with my, my girlfriend and um, there was like a one bit where uh, they started playing Scorpio Rising by Kenneth mm-hmm. Anger. Um, and I was like, my girlfriend, like, you know, that meme where the guy's like whispering to like the girls here in the nightclub. <laughs> it was like that. And I was like, that's that's Scorpio Rising directed by Kenneth Anger. You know, I, I wrote about that last month. <laughs> yeah, you know, but some of them I was really just like I don't, don't didn't recognize, uh, you know, half of them. I I imagine a lot of them were Jonas Mikas stuff films because he was quite heavily in the documentary. But yes, and his work obviously yet. Andy Warhol, a lot of Andy Warhol films. But who I, who, yeah, who I also haven't actually seen overly enough of his like actual like directed works. No, you know. me me neither, and I think. It's interesting talking about this film as a kind of an engagement with Warhol's style and his legacy, because obviously if when you talk to people who know that Andy Warhol directed films, the, the ones people talk about tend to be the extreme durational pieces, you know, the eight-hour films of the Empire State yeah. Building and things like yeah, that. Which they but, talked about, actually, in this documentary. They do. Yeah. But the ones they actually show are a very different side of his work, aren't they? It's a very sort of quick, psychedelic sort of yeah. fast style. Yeah, not really like no plot, just like a mm. bit. I, I mean, a, a bit like kind of anger, who you know, yeah. was quite similar. You know, sort of very like short films, like seven, ten minutes, very weird, no plot, just like I guess artsy which is such a terrible yeah. of a word but you know and I, I well, sometimes thought, it's all you've got exactly yeah and I, I thought it was interesting this documentary because whilst it's called the velvet underground and it is mm. very obviously about the velvet underground it was it felt to me like it was about so much more than just the velvet underground it was yeah kind of just about the 60s in general mm. you know because it started had lots of like as I said, uh, Joe Asmika has talked a lot about cinema, Andy Warhol and like the art scene, you know, sort of like John Cale's like background and like classical music kind of felt a lot more, you know, it wasn't just like, oh, here's the Velvet Underground, they were a band. Yeah. It was really trying to tell you, inform you what the 60s was like to be alive yeah. in that period. I think that's one of the interesting things about the Velvet Underground, because there's a level on which you can say they embodied the 60s, that they, in a lot of ways, they were a band who couldn't have existed at any other time. And yet, when you actually look back at what music was, you know, making an impact during the 60s, they were not as relevant directly as a lot of bands that are now completely forgotten. It took a while for people to cotton on to the fact that they were at at the cutting edge of so many things at that point. Yeah, I mean, they, they, you know, I've always been under the assumption that the, maybe the last few albums were popular, but that especially the first two albums, they were just, they were not liked at all, really by anyone. They were very much, well, obviously some people, um, I can't remember the guy who's in the documentary who is, oh, I forgot his name already, Anthony something, Anthony Hickman maybe. He and he just absolutely loves the Velvet Underground. Like he's every every clip of him talking, he is just like <laughs> like complete endearment. But yeah, other than him, you know, I think it was there was you know there were, as you said, there was lots of other bands, the Beatles, Beach Boys, etc. You know, these kind of more poppy. Uh, bands that were definitely much more popular before. Mm. Well, you know, there's a the great part of the documentary where they kind of it talks about the tour on the west coast, 
and you know that you see them all just like clad in black yeah <laughs> and just like has all these like hippies and they're just like so standard i didn't i never really thought about the contrast between like the new mm. york and the and the california at the time i i thought that was really um well done actually yeah, Lou Reed has a fantastically bitchy line about the West Coast acid rock scene. And it comes after you've had quite a lengthy section of the film that deals with how experimental and how sort of fueled by artists like Warhol and Mikus, the Velvet Underground's New York shows were, how cutting edge yeah. they were back in their home city. And then Lou Reed gets out to the West Coast and he says, yeah, their idea of a light show is just to have a slide projection of butter <laughs> on the wall, which yeah, is yeah. an amazing <laughs> diss. Yeah, and I thought it was very funny, the um, the Morintika and I can't remember her name either, the Amber, I think, uh, like uh, Warhol's sort of sidekick. They were just like talking about how much they hated hippies <laughs> and how yes. much like, you couldn't give flowers to people. They wanted to shoot you and stuff. And, you know, <laughs> I, just, I just thought it was very, um, it's just a very interesting uh, a juxtaposition between those two scenes. Um, and I, I guess, yeah, I just never really thought about them being so different. But of course, New York at, in the 60s was, you know, horrible. Not horrible, like, you yeah. know, but it was very, like, just a very dark time to be in New York, which is, you know, sort of kind of touched upon, you know, by the sort of, you know, Lou Reed's addiction. Well, actually, mm. I think, I don't know. I don't actually know if he was the only, like, real uh, drug user. I think John Kell did. He seemed fairly, um, you know, <laughs> no, I, yeah. I don't want to say the word normal, but, you know, sort of. Um, he seemed lucid, like to say. Yeah. And I, yeah. I actually, I loved the John Cale stuff because I think he's just such a good musician. And so I could his, listen to him talk for like hours. And... Well, he he is. And again, this might surprise people who have a, a kind of a, a pop cultural level knowledge of the Velvet Underground, where if people have heard of the band, they're like, oh, yeah, Lou Reed's old band. Yeah, I know yeah. that. Uh, but you are introduced to it in this film through John Cale's eyes. He's kind of your viewpoint character, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, well, I mean, I guess a lot of that is probably because I do wonder how different this would be if Lou Reed was still alive. Mm. You know, if, if it was made, well, if he was still alive or if it was made 10 years ago and it was not 10 years ago, but, you know, well, you know, 12 yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Because um, obviously Cale is like the, the living member who is really still associated with, the Velvet Underground, but I, I, yeah, you're right. And the, um, you know, you get a lot of his backstory. You know, like being from Wales, being a minor, and also I really liked the the bit at the start where it kind of introduces the members, and it has the, the split screen of like the yeah. members' face, which I think is Andy Warhol footage. I mean, I guess probably. I don't know if it's exactly footage, but there you're right that there are like large parts of it where Todd Haynes is is consciously mimicking that kind of early Warhol style yeah. to the extent where there are sections where it goes into the films that Warhol made as as back projections for the Velvet Underground. Yeah. And it's sometimes quite hard to tell where Haynes' footage ends. Yeah, yeah. I Honestly, I thought it was very... Because I don't know how much of it... I th what I'm trying to say is that um, it's funny you mention that because there were times where I couldn't work out where the archive footage was. That's like, really... why you need the uh, Criterion disc, yeah. the trivia track, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's true. I think it, and I think in that sense, it was good because it it weaved it all quite seamlessly. Like it didn't ever really feel like. Sometimes I find documentaries can be quite jarring. Like mm. you know, it's very like you know not smooth. Like it's like oh, here's the archive footage. Here's an interview. Yes, is, yeah. Is someone talking over something? But this kind of just felt like it was all just part of the same thing, and it just like carried on. It wasn't. It, it wasn't just like clunky. I guess is the yeah, because it's one of the sort of quietly interesting stylistic gambles in this is that you are. I counted about sixteen minutes in before you've got your first talking head interview. Before that, it's all archive footage yeah. it's audio i don't know whether it's like archive audio or new audio but it's wow, deliberately yeah. 
it's very forcefully going against that kind of Friday night on BBC4 style of music documentary that I think you were describing there. Yeah, I think the, um, I mean, the voiceovers, I assume are archive. I mean, because some of them, obviously some of the people talking are dead. Yeah. Um, but also they do kind of, I kind of wonder if it was all recorded at the same time. I don't know. I don't know if it's from, I guess they're from different interviews, but hmm. it's quite hard to tell because there's no like um, context. You know what I mean? Like Lou, Lou Reed will just yeah. start talking and you don't really know what he's an- what question he's answering <laughs> or if he's even answering a question. He just starts talking. Yeah. Um, but it's never not interesting. You know, whatever he's talking about, you're always kind of just like, what's he going to say next? Completely. Yeah, I think it... Him and Kale do come across in it as, as rightly fascinating characters, and there are some lovely anecdotes and quotes in it. I, I had to giggle when I found out that Kale bought his first viola because uh, the music shop didn't have any violins. And you think, <laughs> yeah, that's probably why most people buy a viola, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I just thought the. Um... John Cale stuff was so interesting and the whole like um, him talking about drone music and just mm. I could just listen to him talking about music for so long like it's just um, and you know you did really get the sense of you know but actually I I've, I forgot that John Cale wasn't in Velvet We're Going Around for the first four albums I forgot that he was you know kicked out left kicked out I guess yeah really. yeah Um, so I I was assuming he'd kind of be in the whole thing I guess he is still you know he still appears even after it gets to the point where he's not in the band anymore. But when it happened, I was like, Oh God, I, f- I forgot this happened. Like, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's it's just funny that, isn't it? Cause yeah. W- when I listened to the velvet underground albums with the arguable exception of loaded, but certainly when I listened to velvet underground and Nico white, light, white heat, the velvet underground and VU, the posthumous like outtakes compilation, mm-hmm. I think those albums sound pretty much of a style. You know, you can say things like, obviously, White Hike, White Light, White Heat's the really dissonant, noisy yeah. one, and the Which self-titled. It's a great album. Yeah, completely. Yeah, Underrated. you can spot little variations in them, but listening to them, you wouldn't think this is a band who are going through turmoil and changes of membership. They sound pretty drilled they sound of a piece they've got their style and they know how to explore it i think yeah i think i don't know if that's partly because maybe with the third album they kind of didn't want to change too much so they were mm. kind of like it's kind of that middle ground between like the very i don't know like oh, <laughs> i don't i don't want to say it's like the beatles loaded but it's very it is kind of like west coast music almost like if yeah, it's kind of yeah. mid-60s in, in california you wouldn't it wouldn't have been out of place which is funny yeah. because when they go to West Coast and they have all these hate and hippies and they have this kind of disputes, <laughs> they'll end up in like four years later releasing an album that almost sounds like it comes from the West Coast. But I think they, um, so the third album to me is kind of that weird, like halfway sort of like, oh, we don't have Kane anymore, but we need to kind of still, we still want to have that kind of sound. Mm. But there's also all these other kind of Lou Reed, I guess, wanting to be bit more mainstream it's kind of what it kind of gave across that he wanted to he wanted to actually the band to actually do be popular rather than just like it's quite funny that isn't it and I, i think if i was editing this i would have not been able to resist cutting from that quote about lou reed wanting it to be more mainstream i would have just cut straight to the murder mystery just to say (laughs) yeah he is how that went (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. but I, i mean i actually don't know how big they really were when they got to the fourth album. I mean, I think there's, the, there's never the, any footage of them playing any large shows. Like, there's never a footage of them playing like these huge venues, like you know, the band yeah. or the Beach Boys would play. You know, there's... the myth of the Velvet Underground is that you know they sold very few records, but everyone who bought those records was influenced by them. And you know, yeah. it is a myth, but there's an element of truth to that. I think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that that's, I mean, it's obviously true to some extent because they are, they have prevailed, you know, they they are mm. still, you know, I guess, you know, one of the most popular bands from the 60s, not at the time, but, you know, in sort of modern times, you know, how many yeah, people have yeah. you seen with a t-shirt with the banana on the front? 
or exactly you know or a poster yeah. in their bedroom with the banana on it like it's you know it's just it's it's fascinating to me because you know i i don't my history isn't perfect i'm not entirely sure what point in time the velvet underground really became like reappraised and or maybe mm. it was kind of more of a gradual you know sort of like every kind of five years or so they got a bit bigger they got a bit bigger or if there was like a an event you know there's a musician i really like uh, you probably might like him too nick drake uh the oh folk yeah singer. yeah and he you know he he killed himself because he wasn't very popular but then in like yeah. i think it was in mid 90s ford used his song in one of their adverts and he yes. just became like immediately popular afterwards like immensely popular uh like 20 yeah. or 30 years after he died and I just think it's always, you know, I don't know what that Ford advert was for the other underground. Or maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was pure underground, you know, just like very slowly. Um... I think that, that my sort of understanding of the situation, which is obviously, you know, based on having not been born until the 80s. <laughs> so take this with a pinch of salt. But my understanding is that it was like you're describing, you know, they split and they had a small cult fan base and it started growing. Certainly with punk, uh, the Velvet Underground became more influential and you do have kind of proto-punk and new wave musicians like Jonathan Richman in this film talking about how yeah. the Velvet Underground influenced their music. So it grows and grows. I would say... By the 80s, they must be a pretty solid cult band because that's when VU was released. And, yeah. you know, you do not release a compilation album of unreleased songs for a band who famously didn't sell any albums unless yeah. you're pretty sure that's going to sell now. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think it's interesting, you know, the term cult band because mm. obviously people use cult films so frequently. And, you know, there's, I can think of dozens of films that have been terribly unpopular at the time and then eventually have become you know pretty popular over time because you know maybe yeah holly and kale or something wrote about it and everyone was like oh actually you know maybe that film was good but i yeah, think it's, yeah it's hard to think about cool bands but i think the velvet underground if there ever was going to be a cool band they would be it like they are the the ultimate band that sort of you know famously were just not popular yeah and became huge and i i don't know if there's i can't think of a crazy amount of examples of that because lots of bands that don't do very well at the time you know mm. they might get bigger but i don't think any of them reach the same height as, as something like the velvet underground i think it's always hard to work it out because generally when a band is like universally hailed as good after they've been unsuccessful and i think that is what happened what's happened with the velvet underground if you've said that the velvet underground are part of the canon of great 60s rock music no one's going to laugh at you at this point but yeah. after that happens for a while it's like everyone just pretends they liked them at the time i find yeah 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 definitely or the, yeah or that it was different back then or yeah yeah yeah, but, I mean, yeah. Too, yeah. I mean, I was, you know, I wasn't even alive in the eighties. So, <laughs> mm. <laughs> by the time I was born, I was born. They were they were a very big uh, band. Although, to be honest with you, I, I have to. I was, Velvet Underground were never actually a band when I was younger. I was really, um, I haven't really listened to it that much because, I don't know. I I was really into punk music when I was younger, when I was about sixteen, seventeen, um, and yeah, I still am. But it was my when i was a student especially that was my like big thing so i think i maybe i i kind of skipped over that like sort of proto rock proto punk thing and just went straight to punk and then yeah. i've kind of been like working my way backwards yeah i i had a pretty similar journey i was very into punk as a teenager and by the time i was at the age you're describing and i started listening to the velvet underground the the rest of my musical diet was like Radiohead, spiritualized REM. So yeah. the first thing that strikes me about listening to a song like Sunday Morning or Pale Blue Eyes is, oh, oh shit, this doesn't sound dated at all. This sounds exactly like the new music I'm listening to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's when we were watching this, me and my girlfriend, I think it was maybe when we finished it, you know, my girlfriend said, it's crazy that, you know, this was music was released like 60, like 55 years ago. 
when mm. it almost still sounds like it's from the future. Yeah. It, it almost like we ha- still haven't caught up with some of these Completely. Actually, some of these songs, some of these compositions. You know, stuff like European Sun or um Heroin, like you know, those films well, are, I, those I've got to talk about like, heroin. Yeah. Heroin is the song that gets like a Mark Harrison, who's been a guest on this podcast many times, says there is always a point in every music documentary where a talking head is brought on to say, and what you've got to understand is no one had ever heard anything like that before. (laughs) Now, I think the Velvet Underground has the most justifiable inclusion of that in music documentary history, because A, it's said by Mary Warrenov, who was one of the original Warhol superstars. So that's that's, really cool. That's who I was trying to refer to. Ah, earlier, yes. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Name is so th- that's, that's very classy, I think. But also the other thing is, w- when you're saying it about a song like Heroin, you think, yeah, fair point. I don't think I've ever heard anything like that before. And I'm yeah. living in 2022. Yeah, 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 it's true. I, th- I honestly don't... I don't think there's a song that comes out that's as raw and... And also beautiful at the same time as that. Mm. It, it has that very strange, it's melancholic, but it's also angry. And it, yeah, yeah. I think, and I, it's funny because when when I, when they were, I could hear it playing it. It just made me remind me of that scene in that um, Andrew Dominic film where they they inject heroin and that's yes. on place. <laughs> and it's just like the most like crazy needle job I've ever seen. I'm not sure in a good way or a bad way, but. I remember a, a lot of people at the time, and I, I am a big defender of killing them softly. I'm, I'm up and down with Dominic in, in general, but I love that film. I remember some people had the temerity to say it is a bit obvious to play the song Heroin over a scene of people shooting up heroin. And you think, yeah, fair point, but what song is it that better sort of sums up the feeling of shooting up heroin in an absolutely <laughs> miserable DOS house. You know, what? Yeah. Ca- Carly Rae Jepsen doesn't have anything that can really fill the space there, I find. No, no, I, I actually wonder what Lid Reed would have thought of that, that concept of someone using his band, the, mm-hmm. using that song in that scene. I think he probably would have liked it, to be fair. I think he'd have been cool with it. I think he'd have liked the film. I can't base that on anything, but I'd like to think Lou Reed would have backed me up on killing them softly. And yeah, yeah, and I think that... And also, you know, the, the Vovel Underground outside of this film, obviously, but the music mm. has been so used in films and also just, like, influential to films. You know, I'm thinking of sort of the, like, the no-wave movement in New York... Mm. You know, Jim John Moose, Abel Ferrara, people like that. Um, yeah. I, ve- I feel very much that a lot of those people are indebted to the Volvo Underground, even if it's a different art form. Yeah, you know? I've just had an absolute penny drop moment because you mentioned earlier the Nick Drake car adverse and you said, what is uh, the Velvet Underground's ca- sort of Nick Drake car advert moment? I don't think this was the moment. I think they had uh, like established themselves as a, as a major band by then. But in the early 90s, there was a Dunlop Tires advert directed by Tony Kay, who went on to do American History X, that used Venus in Furs. Right. And it yeah. is bananas. Like s- sometimes, sometimes you see like these classic songs being used on commercials and you think well they haven't really grasped the subversive character of the song that is one of the few tv commercials where you think no they have grasped it <laughs> to the point where i'm genuinely astonished that dunlop signed off on that thing yeah yeah it's, i haven't seen that but i i just oh i just found out i just found it on youtube so i will watch that after um, yes, the, the, ni- the nineties was an incredibly weird time for adverts. <laughs> yes, <laughs> some of the yeah. David Lynch ones from that period of time are just have no idea how <laughs> any of them got made. Um, yeah, there's like one of Nike or Adidas or something where it's just a guy like running, and it's like I think it's in like different weird colors, and there's in the desert, and there's no story. It's just a guy running through like all these like weird objects, and I, yeah, I saw, saw recently yesterday that. Um, Speaking of adverts, slight dive, slight diversion. Mm. But uh, Terence Malick has just directed an advert for um, Louis Vuitton, and it's <laughs> it's, very, it's it's very weird. Huh? Like 
it's like the days of heaven, but just like an advert for with Louis Vuitton. handbags. Yeah, no, there's no handbags. <laughs> it's just like kids oh, running around with like Louis Vuitton t-shirts. So. <laughs> it's very weird, isn't it? Yeah, just <laughs> just you know, slight detour of uh, of adverts, but um, but yeah, I yes. think that. Yeah, I mean, the the ad use of adverts, I would imagine, was probably quite, you know, having these directors make adverts and using these songs definitely would have mm. done something to these bands. I think, yeah, it, it's... I, I lived through the 90s, and I, yeah, I vividly remember even at the time thinking, man, adverts make no sense anymore. This is kind of rad. <laughs> I, I do think part of it is like you'd got a new set of restrictions about what advertising could be, which you know, obviously mostly targeted alcohol and tobacco and things like that. But in the case of a car advert, it meant you, you couldn't make a car advert, which say had someone like breaking the speed limit and having like an attractive woman looking on admiringly as they <laughs> drove irresponsibly and you know, all that was out of the window uh, so for some reason everyone went oh if we can't do the sort of sexy hard sell there's um nowhere left to go other than dadaism and depressing 70s rock i guess that's the only <laughs> thing we've got left yeah i wish they'd do it still now but... yes it was a fun time but yeah yeah, I think um, and I think it's interesting talking about the sort of post seventies underground stuff, mm. and I, you know, I don't, I don't think this is a detriment to the documentary, but I think it would have been interesting to have something about mm. how the band's legacy changed. I mean, you know, you could talking about the Velvet Underground, it's a two-hour documentary, but you could mm. easily fill six hours. You know, you could easily yeah. do the Beatles get back for the Velvet Underground. Completely, like, you know, yeah. three, three hour like, parts. The few negative reviews I've found of this have said um, that it gives the last two albums, it gives the Velvet Underground and Loaded Short Shrift, which I don't necessarily agree with that. But, you know, it, it, it is testament to the fact that there is stuff that hasn't been mined in here yet. Yeah. I don't. I wouldn't say it's a bad thing. I do agree mm. that it doesn't give those albums as much time, but when yeah. you're when you're trying to cover a band with such incredible detail and a band that's done so much and has such an impact, you can't mm. you can't capture everything in two hours. Like Todd Haynes yeah. made a decision to decide what was the most interesting stuff and use the time to fill that. And I I personally think that. I mean, I don't know how it would have been if he'd spent. 20 minutes on loaded instead of 20 minutes on John Cale's background of mining, but I would mm. definitely would have preferred the, the latter. Cause I just think that, yeah, you know, you can go on Wikipedia and look at facts about loaded or see if Doug Yule yeah. can contribute to it. But I think that the formation of the band in the early sixties and like that to me was very interesting and I did spend a lot of time on it, but I think that that was good. Yeah, I agree. I think you have to remember when you talk about stuff like this, that documentary is a storytelling medium. And I think Haynes is of the opinion that the story, you know, the narrative engine of the Velvet Underground is is in that early work. It's about how, yeah. like, a, a kid from a troubled background met a Welsh viola player and they got together at the most famous artist in the world, Gaff, and he put them in touch with a German supermodel who sang, <laughs> kind of. And, you know, that that's that's the amazing bit. That's yes. the, the narrative engine, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, when Nico came on screen, and my, my girlfriend was like, wow, she was in La Dolce Vita, or how have you said? Ah. I had no idea she was... I didn't actually really know she was an actor, to be honest with you. Uh, maybe I just... I don't even know if I've actually ever seen, really seen her or anything. I don't, I don't know what... I don't know if she had much of an acting career after the Velvet Underground. I suppose probably not, because she was a huge. No, singer, I think but... it it was more of a, a sort of modelling with occasional dabbling in acting yeah. thing. I think my main reaction when Nico came on was like, I, I forget who said it, but someone says something like, "Oh, uh, Andy wanted to get another singer in because he thought Lou's voice was kind of flat." And you think, well, <laughs> out of the frying pan and into the fire, there. To yeah. be honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're both quite flat and that's kind yeah. of what makes it good i think that's the charm i agree but yeah yeah you know you listen to some of that albia mirror and is she mm. a good singer i don't know but is it is it a good song yes absolutely 
So yeah, no, it's just. I think it's kind of like her voice. I don't know if it's stereotypically good, but it has that haunting. There's something haunting about it that I think. I don't know. It's just it sucks you in. I, it's just something about it. You can't. I can't. You know, mm. whenever you put that song on or, or any of her songs, even the ones that she did after the Velvet Underground, there's just something about them that. Oh yeah, I mean, I don't want to sort of get too into talking about members' solo career because with yeah. with Reed and Kale, there is so much to talk about. But part of the Velvet Underground's cinematic legacy is the incredible use of those Nico solo tracks in the Royal Tenenbaums by Wes Anderson. Yes, and also the um, that's great. And there's a, a Claire Denis film, uh, U.S. Go Home. I don't know if you. Oh right, saw. I haven't seen that one. I'm yeah, it's really it's a TV film, and they they play the Nico song at the end of that as well, and it's right. Yeah, you know, so I think it's uh, these days they play something. Yeah, and it's so effective, and yeah, and uh, yeah, I I think there's, I've, I've definitely seen Venus and Furs used a lot, Albi mm. Amira used a lot. They just you know, I feel like if you're a filmmaker, the Velvet Underground is just like, you're not going to go wrong, are you really? <laughs> <laughs> because it's it, yeah it's such fits a every mood of music yeah and it can fit every mood as well there's like yeah i'm waiting for the man is quite upbeat you know then you've got mm. heroin very sad you know you have all these you know i think it's interesting that this documentary kind of didn't really touch on it but it kind of give you the impression that I'm, i kind of i hate when people say like oh someone made something accidentally but it almost mm. fe- felt like the, these songs when you listen to the album in full they don't really have any sort of, they don't really fit together. There's no yeah. cohesion at all. It kind of just feels like they just made a bunch of random songs, dumped them together, and we're like, here you go. But I think, I think that's, that's why it works so well. Yeah, I think that's part of their legacy too, and I think that's maybe part of why they didn't catch on initially, because when you think about things like the album sequencing or, or Nico and Lou Reed's sort of conventionally quote unquote bad voices yeah. there hadn't really been anything in rock music that had that kind of quality that you saw you, you, you were seeing in other art mediums you know Andy Warhol obviously was doing it in the visual art world you have Jean-Luc Godard around the same time doing films which don't have conventional continuity editing yeah. and that's part of the plan but I don't think there had been anything in rock music at that point that made you sit and think, hang on, have they got this catastrophically wrong or is this genius? Yeah, I know. It's, it's funny you say that actually with, with Godard because I, I, I studied, I did a, a lecture on Night of the Living Dead at my uni course, mm. which is yeah. kind of 68, kind of around the same time as the other underground. And there's a, one of the things I had to read for it talked about the editing of that film is like, kind of like Godard, like it has, it It doesn't have any uh, establishing shots, like it just like jump cuts to like random things and you yeah. have no idea what's going on. And one of the things that people said was, um, one of the criticisms it got was that it felt like it was just amateur. Like it doesn't, yeah. it's, it's not artful, it's just he doesn't know what he's doing. But then you look back at it 50 years later or, or 80, uh, 40 or 50, whatever, and you're kind of like, God, this is genius. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. this is so good. Like, no one does this. Like, still no one's really doing this kind of stuff. And I think... Completely, it, yeah. It, as you said, yeah. it, it does apply to Velvet Underground. And I, I still can't think of many bands that are brave enough to put out a full-length album where there's no, like, consistency or coherence. Mm. You know, even some of the greatest... You know, I really love um, something like Television, Marky Moon, very loud, influential post album. It still has cohesion. Like, it still has, like, a... You know, every song sounds kind of similar. But with the Velvet Underground, it's just like nothing. Not not one song sounds the same. And I think that's... I think when I hear albums that don't have that kind of cohesive album feel normally, now it's kind of a negative thing where it's like, you know, it's like a Drake album where you thought, I, I don't actually know what the fuck I'm doing. I'm just going to make every track in a different style and hopefully people connect with one of them. Uh, but but you, you, no know, you know why people do that? Drake does that because yeah. if you release 20 songs and all of them sound mm. different, if one of them gets popular on TikTok, you yeah. can get 200 plays and that's it. So it's yeah. that idea of like just scattershotting like different genres to try and get one hit. 
but I don't think the Velvet Underground were doing that. <laughs> I don't think that's it. I don't think that Lou Reed and John Cale were sat there going, all right, if we can get the 10-minute atonal viola song about heroin <laughs> market on board, maybe it'll carry the rest of this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've we've talked quite rightly a lot about the band and the music, and it is incredible. Uh, I just want to talk a bit about Todd Haynes because this is kind of an interesting juncture in his career to do it. I've, I've, maybe there is like another documentary thing he's done deep in the vaults of his career, but I, yeah, the I'm only, sure, the only think... counter example I can think of is like. There's a segment in his first film, Poison, which is a sort of mock documentary about a juvenile delinquent. And it it does show you that he knows the grammar and the cliches of documentary form very well, but it's still not a documentary. Yeah, true. And I think that there's in- interesting stuff about, you know, he's in, you know, the Bob Dylan film and the mm. Velvet Goldmine, which is kind of, you know, inspired by like Bowie or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's always that kind of musical element, I guess. It's funny. Mm. I'm, I'm actually, I, I haven't seen many Todd Haynes films actually, but the ones I have seen, I, I actually ha- haven't all been that huge on, but I did like mm. this a lot. And maybe, I don't know. I, I saw um, Far From Heaven, which I thought was okay, but you know, I didn't, yeah. I thought it was just, it's just Douglas Sirk really, isn't it? But um yeah, and then I saw Dark Waters as well, which I saw like last a few years ago, and I thought it was okay. But what's interesting is he did that one, and then the Velvet Underground. And to me, I didn't like Dark Waters because it was so. I just thought it was so like, sim- like conventional. It was just like yeah. a very like, oh, here's another film that you know it's about a lawyer or something, and he takes on Big Pharma or he takes on this company because they're polluting the water. Mm. I just I was like, I've seen that film. Michael Mann made that film twenty years ago. Yeah, yeah, and it was amazing. Um, but the Velvet Underground felt not conventional and mm. just like felt like a very rare thing for music documentaries. And no, I, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I'm a I'm a big Todd Haynes fan, um, but I, I agree with you that he is he is maybe too capable of sort of just doing something that is is fairly conventional from time to time. Uh, this does remind me more of Poison and Velvet Gold Mine and I'm Not There in, in its more experimental leanings. But yeah. it's also kind of interesting because I think it engages with a, a kind of art house cinema that he was around for, but he didn't connect with, which is that kind of 2000s vogue for extreme slowness. You know, around that time, he was doing things like far from heaven and i'm not there which are very maximalist you know no one's going to mistake them for simon liang uh yeah. but here he, he has to actually engage with warhol and lamont young and all those people who were doing durational work as as part of a a kind of artistic philosophy and i thought that was interesting i like that he's chosen the most unfashionable time to do this if he'd done it in the 2000s i'd have considered him a bandwagon jumper to be honest <laughs> yeah i think it's um i'm not sure what spot the uh him making the documentary i don't know if there's because obviously you know for example i mentioned earlier the, the beatles one that came out recently was i mm. think because they found the footage or something or, yeah or the footage had been recovered or something I don't know if this was something that Todd Haynes would just was just like, I want to do it. Or it does say on, I did read that he was hired to direct it. So I'm not even sure if it was even his like passion project that he's been planning for so long and he finally got funding for it. More it was, there was Apple TV wanted to make, you know, actually I'm reading here that Apple TV Apple. acquired distribution yeah. rights after it was made. But, ah, um, but yeah, it's interesting because it it, is, it really does feel like something that Todd Haynes has sort of been making for a while. And it, it the amount of detail it has in care, it really feels like a passion project. But then it, yeah, you know, I, you know, I don't know if it's, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure if, I actually don't know if Todd Haynes is one of those directors who sort of doesn't, sorry, <laughs> just trying to get my voice. Um, you know, sort of like a director who 
I don't want to say like director for hire because that kind of sounds like a sort of it doesn't sound yeah really, I, I but, think you know, there's a, there's a but, kind of nobility in that right so I think we should yeah. we should say up front that when we say director for hire you think well you know Anthony Mann was a director for hire exactly. Robert Aldrich was a director for hire there's no sort so, of negativity in it yeah I mean Francis Ford Coppola was a director for hire for 20 years because he bankrupted yeah. himself <laughs> so, <laughs> you know I, I, but I, yeah I'm not sure if I don't know enough about him to know that oh the films he makes the ones that he he's because he's like just wants to do them and he comes up with them and he finds funding or is he sort of more like go make a Bob Dylan film and then he comes back with this like random experimental Bob Dylan <laughs> film that people are like what the hell have you done this for um, I think he is he, he is capable of making films that are very sort of personal and passionate and I mean with something like Far From Heaven whatever you say about it there was no one in the early noughties going I'd like to have a really detailed Douglas Sirk pastiche. You know, that's the hot genre right now. We need yeah. someone to make that. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think I, I can I can imagine him working for hire, but I think he manages, particularly in this case, to invest a lot of his personality in it, particularly when it comes uh, to the discussion of like Lou Reed as, as a queer artist, because Haynes yes. was one of that early 90s new queer the cinema, cinema yeah. school, and he is kept very close to that as like an artistic guiding uh, spirit throughout his career. Yeah, definitely. I, I thought that that was, you know, def- a very interesting part of the documentary mm. that you sort of always forget that, you know, they were kind of, Lou Reed was like playing gay nightclubs very yeah. early on in his career and I, and also you know as I, said, as I said earlier the sort of use of like things like Kenneth Anger obviously mm. you know um and having all this detailed background uh, I was I, I thought that was very informative and also would have been very easy to omit from the documentary it would have been very easy to just you know be replace it with 10 minutes or something else because there is so much content but yeah as you said he very specifically spends a decent amount of time talking about that. So obviously, as you said, it's very, excuse me, very obvious that it's quite personal. Yeah, subjects. and I think the other thing that feels very organic to Haynes in this is that he's very interested in the the sort of relationship between artists and fans that Velvet Goldmine, I think if you took it as like, a disguised biopic of David Bowie, it you would come to the conclusion that it's quite a bad film, uh, but it's not. That just means that you shouldn't come to it as that. You should yeah. come to Velvet Goldmine as like a Midwestern queer kid and what he saw glam as, you know, what that what glam gave to him. Yeah, and I think he it's very good for him to be let loose in a, a kind of environment like Andy Warhol's factory, where the promise of it is if you go to one of Andy Warhol's parties to see a band and you look interesting enough, well, you could be in the band next week, you <laughs> yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it's it's interesting because, it, as you said, to, talking about how uh, someone experiences glam, it mm. also kind of felt like it was made by someone through their own perception of of how they listen to the Velvet Underground. And, and, you know, when we're talking earlier about people saying that they didn't include X, Y thing, it almost yeah. feels like Todd Haynes is basically showing us what he liked about the Velvet Underground rather mm. than like, oh, here are the important part. You know, this is all the key things about the Velvet Underground. It's more just like, well, here's what I liked about them. Maybe you like it too, kind of thing. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. here's the footage that I thought was interesting and the, the you know, the, the voiceovers that I thought were interesting. And mm. what I connected with, rather than just like, um, well, we have 10 minutes about this album, 20 minutes about this album, 30 minutes about this album. It didn't really feel like that. It kind of just felt more like, here's just a bunch of stuff I thought was really cool about the Love Underground. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But obviously structured in a way that it does, you know, it's not just like um, impressionistic sort of like mm. random scenes of like from the 70s, then goes to the 60s, then goes back to the 70s. It is very linear in a sort of uh, chaotic way, I guess. Yeah, I think the only one of those more linear kind of music documentaries that I think is a really 
good cinematic experience for me is Edgar Wright's The Sparks Brothers. Uh, yeah, I didn't see Partly that. because he's such a, a naturally entertaining director, but also because I, I like how absolutely rigid he is about it. Like he says, all right, Sparks have made a ridiculous number of albums and I am going to talk to you about every fucking one of them. And I think when you've got that kind of subject matter, the completest urge is kind of interesting but with the velvet underground yeah i completely agree the interesting thing is to give people a sense of what it was was like to roll up at one of the exploding plastic inevitable shows and that's more interesting than saying ah well this song was written about this person and this song we we almost recorded it this way but we decided not to yeah Yeah, i i I do think the more personal touch is is what makes it really sing yeah i i do think that it's very easy for documentaries, especially about music, but really about anything, to just really focus on like small the details that you can just find on Wikipedia. Yeah. Or or any sort of interview. You know, like mm. I don't want to watch a Velvet Underground song. Uh, sorry, a Velvet Underground documentary, as you said, to hear why John Cale decided to play that note instead of this note, or yeah, produce a song by three minutes or something. I want to. I want to see footage of them playing. I want to hear them talk about what it was like to be alive at that time. I want to hear about, mm. you know, how they, how their relationship to Andy Warhol was not yeah. necessarily about the creation of their music because obviously the music is important, but this, this documentary doesn't really feel like it's actually about the music. It's more about the, the, the people and yeah, the, and, the world know, that they inhabited in the sixties, which almost feels like could never happen again. Exactly, yeah. I mean, if you want to listen to the Velvet Underground music, you are spoiled for choice because, as I say, all the albums are freely available. And as we've mentioned, they all hold up spectacularly well today. So, Mm. yeah, I I think there is plenty of music here. I liked that there was plenty of music here, but I also liked that that's not the entirety of what the film is about. Yeah, I think it definitely... It's definitely good to have the music playing, but I, I think, yeah, it was good that it sort of doesn't just mm. focus on the details of, of songwriting. It's not just got footage of John Cale in a studio. <laughs> you know, yeah. With Doug yeah. Ewell in a studio just, like, writing a song. Like, it's just... Because that's just not really... I think that would have been a disservice to make a conventional documentary. I, no, I, I watched completely. a documentary recently, and I actually reviewed it for The Geek Show, mm. which was about Gene Rowland. The French, oh, yes, yeah. and whilst it had some good information, I, I felt like it was such a conventional documentary for such an incredibly unconventional director. Mm. You know, his films are so weird, make no sense, have very weird imagery. Yeah. Um, but the documentary was just talking heads from out film to film, talking heads, and that was kind of it. And I like that this documentary it has you know linear, it has some bits of linear and it has some interviews, but it it kind of feels as crazy and idiosyncratic as the Velvet Underground. It feels like yeah. it matches the top, the, the subject matches the the form almost. I agree. I think we, we should close off by asking a question that has, uh, has been on my lips for ages, but unfortunately we've talked about so many really uh, deep matters in music appreciation and artist criticism that it makes me feel really dumb to reduce everything to this now but i'm gonna do it obviously <laughs> uh what is your favorite velvet underground album because it's I'm... tricky isn't it you reveal yeah. something about yourself it's not it's one of those questions where you know you have to dig a bit to work it out i think i think that i if we're saying entire album, I would probably go for the basic decision of, of the Velvet Underground and Nico. Mm. But um, I think the first, I think like five songs of the self-titled album are just like so good. Stunning. Like yeah. I don't, I think that the first half of that album, Candy Says Through to Jesus or Beginning to the Light are so, so good. Like they're just better better than anything on the first album but the first album as a whole is better it yeah. doesn't really make sense but i just think that yeah though it's definitely a toss in those two albums i think the first mm. one would maybe edge it out a bit um but yeah i love i just love like 
first half of the second album. But I, I mean, I, I like White Heat, which is obviously not a very <laughs> particularly popular opinion, but I think the album is really good. I don't know. I think that there is a certain kind of Velvet Underground fan that has like white, like white heat as their ultimate, and I get that because it's it's the most extreme form of them, right? Sometimes if you love something, you want to hear it as as unfiltered as possible, uh, and I understand that. But yeah, uh, what's your my fa- my my favorite is the self titled one, and I always feel a bit guilty saying that because by that point they've lost Kale, they've lost Nico, and you think, well, is it still the same thing but i just think there's there's something about that album that i've never been able to quantify until lou reed actually says it in this documentary when he's talking about candy says which i i agree is just a masterpiece of a song and he says it feels more tense because the music is pretty yeah. you know, it's such a delicate pretty song but it never lets you forget that there's something really painful underneath it and i love yeah. that mix you know you mentioned nick drake it's all over nick drake's music as well yeah. i i just find that mixture of delicacy and pain is really really special to me yeah it's almost like the the self-titled album once all the noise and droning has been stripped away what mm-hmm. are you really left with you're just left with lou reed like a very sad melancholy man singing yeah because the lyrics don't change like the lyrics are no. still very similar to the first album. But as you said, the, the mixing just lets you hear like the sadness like so much more because it hasn't got John Cale going like yeah, over the top with his viola. Which is still great. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, you know, still oh, it's still actually, amazing, yeah. but it's it's a different kind of of sound. And it's yeah. it's definitely way sadder than anything they've done, I think. Um, yeah i agree i I think it it makes the case most strongly even more so maybe than his solo stuff it makes the case more strongly for lou reed as a great songwriter because i think velvet underground and nico is a close second to me but i can imagine someone listening to that record and say all right are these songs well written or are they just weird and i think they are well written but i can understand someone not seeing it but if you think he's not a great songwriter after listening to the self-titled record, I can't help you. I just don't respect your opinions. Yeah, it's like something like David Lynch, for example. You know, he makes all these like really weird films, mm. and someone might be like, "Well, he's just making weird films that don't make any sense." And then you show him the straight story. Yes, a very normal Disney family film. Yeah, and then you, you can't turn away from that and go, "Well, he's not a good filmmaker," because you no, you can do the weird, me. but then you you can just also you can just make the rock album that, yeah. you know, could just be another by the numbers rock album, but it's not, <laughs> you know, because yeah. they made it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what makes the album so good, as you said. Well, uh, if you enjoyed that podcast, listeners, uh, we're back every fortnight, but you can also get a bonus episode every month by donating to our Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash The Geek Show. We are hoping to have a big spoiler episode on Glass Onion, talking about its Janelle Monáe performance and many other things coming up soon. Uh, I don't know if we'll get that because... Uh, you know, obviously, I'll have to wait to Netflix thanks to their unique one week in half a cinema release schedule yeah. uh, is making it a pain in the hole to see. But yeah, it's, uh, actually, it's actually playing. It's actually playing not even so fair, but um, I haven't. It, it's, seen, it's, I haven't even seen the first one. <laughs> it's nowhere near me, unfortunately, and I'm very, very bitter about it. But that is what we're hoping to do. Uh, but yes, until then. Um, you can find me on Letterboxd under Graham Williamson. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Graham W Film. Uh, Oliver, would you just like to remind listeners where people can catch you? Yeah, uh, on Twitter, Oliver T. Parker. Um, and my letterbox is it's just in my Twitter bio. I, I don't actually remember what my name on it is. <laughs> I think it's just Oliver Parker, I think. But um, Yes. Yeah. And until next time, that's your lot from Popscreen. See you next episode.